All right, Luke 4. So jumping back into the text, what we've seen up to this point so far, and it's still early in Jesus' ministry, but over and over again, we've been seeing that Jesus just makes the impossible look effortless. He really does. And with the word, we see he can take care of a problem, whether it be a, a demon possession, boom, be quiet, leave. And the devil and, and his demons, they shudder and they flee. And uh, we're going to see today the same exact thing. Now, now, last time we saw Jesus in the town of Capernaum, specifically in the synagogue. Remember, he was kicked out of his hometown in Nazareth. They tried to kill him. They tried, tried to throw him off a cliff. And he miraculously disappears in their midst. And he goes to Capernaum, a little bit further north on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He's in the synagogue. He gives a teaching on the Sabbath day. And right in the middle of his message, we saw that this demon-possessed man starts shrieking and yelling. And Jesus just says one sentence to the man, be quiet and come out of him. And all of a sudden, this man who's had his life wrecked by the devil is suddenly set free. And it's amazing. And what we're learning here is that Jesus is powerful enough to do what we cannot do. We'll see this happen again and again in Luke. We, we can't defeat demons. We can't raise the dead. We can't stop storms or walk on water. And, and most importantly, we can't do anything at all about our sin problem. But Jesus can. Amen? And so, man, if you don't get anything else from today, I want you to know that Jesus is the source. He, he's the answer. He's the answer. And so we run to him, and this is why we're reading about him, our Lord. Now, Luke has been writing all of this to show us that Jesus is not simply a man of God. He is God. Jesus is God. He, in fact, he is the God-man, the only begotten son of the Father. He's the only one who has ever been like that, the only begotten. And our question over and over as we read these things should be, do I actually believe this for real? Because we're, we're encountering the real Jesus, and, and we have to come to terms with it ourselves. Do I believe that all of this that I'm reading is, in fact, true? Because if it is, that changes everything. That should change my life, how I view everything in my life, including problems. And today we're going to talk about problems. Any, any of you guys have problems in your life right now? You laugh because it's like, when have I ever not had a problem in my life, right? Uh, it's, it's part of life. And today's text, we'll see once again that Jesus makes the impossible happen and that there's no problem in this universe mightier than Jesus Christ. So let's get right into the text. Luke 4, verse 38 says this, Then he got up, he being Jesus, he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. So this is classic, right? Church is over. Let's go get something to eat. Let's go to somebody's house and, and fellowship. And, and here they go. They leave the synagogue, Jesus and his entourage, and they go down to Simon Peter's house, uh, who lived just about 83 feet down the road and slightly to the right. <laughs> and how do I know that? Uh, because there's, this still exists today. Here's a picture of Capernaum. And you can see the, the ruins of the old city of Capernaum. And that thing that looks like, uh, like a UFO that's landed, it's come right over the top of Peter's house and Peter's mother-in-law's house. And that's one crazy thing about going to the Holy Land is people tend to, to build shrines and relics over these sites. And you're like, I, I just want to see the rocks and I can't see them because there's all this gilded things all over the top of it. But there the, the mothership landed over uh, Peter's House, and that's where it is today. You can kind of see that Sea of Galilee in the back. It's really quite a beautiful, idyllic place. But on this particular day, it's not peaceful because they get there, and here we go again. Another problem. Another problem. In fact, Simon Peter has a really huge problem in his life. His mother-in-law lives with him. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. All right. <laughs> That was and actually is pretty standard in many cultures around the world. Middle Eastern culture, Latin culture, uh, it's kind of normal to have the families living together. But that wasn't Peter's problem. Peter's problem is actually that his mother-in-law is very, very sick. We saw that right there in the text. Uh, remember, our author Luke was a doctor by trade. 
He's somebody who knew about sickness. This is what he dealt with. And he is the one who's describing this fever. He describes it as megos in the Greek. That is very high grade, off the charts fever. And this is a severe issue in the first century. You know, they didn't have things that we have today, modern medicine. Uh, and so this was an issue not to be taken lightly. Some commentators attribute Peter's mother-in-law's sickness to what was called lake fever, a recurring illness in that area due to impurities in the nearby waters of the Galilee. Others have said it was some kind of typhus. We don't exactly know, but we do know that Peter's got problems. Surprise, surprise. Peter's a human being living in a fallen world. And so he's got problems in his life. And remember what Jesus once said, in this world you will have trouble. Not the most encouraging start to that sentence, right? But we know that Jesus has overcome the world. But yeah, I asked you earlier, how many of you have problems going on in your life right now? And you said you did. Uh, but I want you to notice now what Peter and the others did with the problem. This is really key. They brought their problem straight to Jesus. There was something that Peter couldn't do anything about himself, and so what did he do? He brought it to the Lord, and the people brought it to the Lord. And this is what we know from the scripture, that there's simply no problem bigger than the power of Jesus. This is one of God's attributes, is that he's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He can do all things. Nothing is impossible for God. And maybe you're pushing back in your mind, you know, well, you don't know my problem. Well, God knows your problem. And I do know Jesus, and I know that he cares about your problem, and that he has the power to act in your life. And so do you have faith in that today? Let's, let's see what Jesus does here for Peter. But first, I want you to notice this, that Jesus listens when we bring our problems to him. Look at verse 38 again. It says, Then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately got up and waited on them. Uh, first thing I want you to notice here is that Jesus listens when we bring our problems to him. Jesus listens. Uh, after he rose from the grave, remember, before he ascended to heaven, what we read in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them, his disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus has all authority. That means he has jurisdiction over all of our problems. So what's your problem? Is, it, is your problem struggling to pay your bills? Is your problem you're scared, you're worried about some diagnosis that you got? Is your problem that, that your kids that you love are running from the Lord? They're resisting him. They're mocking him. Is your problem that, that your marriage is suffering right now? Believe me, I'm, I'm part of the prayer team at church, and we, we know the kind of things that you deal with, and we bring them to the Lord. And, and all of these are among those things that we're dealing with. And I want you to be encouraged that Jesus listens to our problems. And here's the problem with our problems. Most of the time, we tend to spend more time worrying about them than bringing them to Jesus like we should. We obsess over all, all the what-ifs, different stages of life. You know, what if I never get married? What if my husband never trusts in Jesus? What if my wife never comes to faith? What if my kids grow up and walk away from the Lord? What if I can't provide for my family? What, what if I get cancer? Well, what if Jesus is bigger than all of that stuff? What if? Somewhere along the line, we're going to believe what the Bible says or we're not. So what does the Bible say about how we're to handle our issues and our problems? Listen to what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4. He says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to Facebook. No, that's not what he says. No, what does he say? He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then what happens next? Verse 7 of Philippians 4 says, and the peace of God, 
which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that's God's instructions. That's his instructions when we encounter problems. To not worry about anything, but to instead pray about everything, which is essentially bringing our problems to him because he listens and he cares. And, you know, a thousand therapists couldn't say it any better. So we see Peter. We see the others. They bring their problem to the one bigger than their problem. They, they bring the mother-in-law who's on the verge of dying with this fever to Jesus because they know he's bigger than that sickness. After all, what did they just witness? They just saw what took place in the synagogue. A man was freed from demonic possession at Jesus' mere word. And so they had faith. He, he can do something here. And, and one thing we need to realize is that just because we human beings sometimes don't like to hear others' problems, that doesn't mean that the Lord is like that. To be quite honest, I don't like when life gets complicated. <laughs> I don't like problems. I'm like, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm dealing with enough already. I don't need any more. But God is never like that. He says, no, bring it all to me. Bring it all. I can handle it. And why does God desire this from us? Is because when we bring our problems to him, we acknowledge that we're not in authority over the problem, but he is. It's an acknowledgement of God's authority. It's a way we show humility and it's a way we show trust and faith in the Lord and say, I don't got this. I don't. And I'm leaning on you, God, right now. James 4, verse 6 says this, But he, that is God, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And uh, what I think is cool in Bible study, sometimes you, you look at these characters and how they develop over time, and we see the same exact Peter, Simon Peter, that we read about here. Uh, one day, he's going to become an apostle. And years after this moment that we're reading about, He's going to write a letter to the early church that we call 1 Peter. It's in the Bible. It's our scripture. And he writes this, 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7. He says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, that's what Peter grew to understand. Uh, he doesn't say, stop whining, you big babies. And he says, cast your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. And the Bible also says that we're the sheep of his pasture, which means that just like a loving shepherd, Jesus is concerned with every problem that we have. And he wants us to bring them to him. He, he actually cares for our well-being. And so in faith, Peter and the others bring the problem to Jesus, and Jesus is going to do something about the problem. Notice how he responded. Verse 39 and standing over her, Peter's mother-in-law, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she immediately got up and waited on them. Jesus doesn't freak out. He's got full authority. And this is one of the things that's so awesome about the Lord. He's just calm, cool, and collected, and he just takes care of the problem because he has authority. Just as he spoke to the demon in the synagogue and rebuked it, now he speaks to the fever, and that same word, rebuke, is used, which is kind of interesting, right? To rebuke a sickness. Normally you rebuke a, a sentient being. Stop it. Stop doing that. Have you ever said that to a cough or a cold or a fever? Uh, it's kind of unusual. So what's going on here? Uh, many commentators believe that behind this sickness, there's a demonic force at work. And that, that's a possibility. We see later on in, in Luke that Jesus rebukes a storm. Even the same word is used. And, and those same commentators believe that maybe that storm had a demonic origin. After all, trying to capsize the boat that the Son of God is on, that seems like something that the enemy would, would be all about. Uh, but Jesus rebukes this sickness, and Peter's mother-in-law is instantaneously healed. Jesus solved the problem. And, and now there's something I want to be clear about here. When we ask the Lord for help, as we should, we need to remember that it does not mean that he will do everything that we want. Does that make sense? Because I, I want to be clear on that. Because uh, God is not some kind of vending machine. He's God. 
He's God. He knows more than we do. And Jesus can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. And he knows what is best even when we do not. And so sometimes the answer to our request is different than what we expect. Uh, But here, there is an immediate answer to this prayer request, this request for help, rather. They're answered right away in the way that they had hoped. It's amazing that Peter's mother-in-law didn't eventually get better. She immediately got better. And that's pretty characteristic of the miracles of the Lord. Instantaneous. There's no recovery time here, no chicken noodle soup, none of that. She just, boom. She's healed, and then immediately she rose, and what does she do? Puts that apron on, gets into the kitchen, starts getting a plate of hummus and something together. I don't know what they ate. But her hospitality gifts kick in. She, she gets out of bed and starts making food, and I think there's a lesson in that, which is this. The right way to respond to the grace of Jesus is to serve Jesus. The right way to respond to the grace of Jesus is to serve Jesus. She feels compelled to serve after she's been shown such grace. Not, not only we we being shown that the miracle is complete, you know, she was completely healed, she had all the strength to get up and cook, but it's neat that, that she even thinks to do that. Compelled to serve after being shown such grace. Would that be true of us as well, who have been saved by God's grace through faith? You know, there's so many things that that we're not grateful for in life. Anybody grateful for traffic? No? Anybody grateful for physical aches and pains? Twinges? (laughs) No? No, we're not grateful for a lot of these things. We're not grateful for uh, dental work, even though we should be. (laughs) You know, uh, other things that... We live as if we're not thankful for are the grace of God in our life. Uh, in theory, we are, but in practice, our thoughts and actions often reveal our ungratefulness because one of the symptoms of ungratefulness is selfish grumbling. Anybody guilty of that? That could be me. Selfish grumbling. We obsess over what we don't have instead of what we do have and don't deserve. We complain about situations and circumstances. We, we adopt an attitude of entitlement. In short, we want to be served instead of serve. We want to be served rather than serve. But the right way to respond to God's grace in our lives is grateful service from the heart. And, and really, there's, there's no one we ought to be more grateful to than Jesus because he's done more for us than anyone ever has or ever will. We now have access to a holy God because we've been justified by faith through the blood of Jesus who laid down his life for us. And no one's ever loved you that way. So how can we show our gratitude? Grateful service. Grateful service to the king. And and so I want to put forward the question to you as you think about this new year coming. How are you currently serving Jesus? And, And could he be calling you to more service? Or if you are serving him, is he, is he calling you to have a heart of, of grateful service once more? To have that joy of your salvation restored and, and have it come out in your service to others? How are you putting the needs of others above your own? How are you using your time, your talents, your treasures for the kingdom of God? How are you responding to the grace of Jesus? And, and, and it truly is a response. Service should be a a response to God's grace. And we serve him because he first served us. Listen to what Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He said, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, United in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And so you see how it's all tied together. Jesus served us. He was the ultimate servant. And so we're grateful to him 
And so we serve him. How do we serve him? By serving his people. By viewing others as more important than ourselves. By looking to their interests. And so that's what we want to do is, is serve each other in humility. And that could look like a lot of different things. Uh, there's a bulletin board in the lobby. I don't know if you ever noticed it. But just to the right of the drinking fountain there, there's a, a list. It just says ways to serve your church. Go ahead, take a look at that list and consider maybe God would want to use me in one of these ways. And, and there's so many different spiritual gifts that God gives his church that we can use for edification of one another. Gifts and talents. I'm just thinking of, of some things that I see in our church. I, I see people using their gift of hospitality. They, they open up their home to have people over for dinner. I, I see people offering to babysit for others. What a beautiful way to show your gift of hospitality. There are those who are, are using their gift of teaching, Sunday school, Bible studies, to people teaching our, our precious little lambs the gospel of Jesus in, in children's church, Sunday school. People who are holding babies, providing tired parents with an hour of relief so they can soak up God's word, find strength for the week. That's a ministry. Maybe that could be your ministry. Uh, there's people preparing coffee. Who got coffee today? Anybody? Whew. Mmm, mm, that's rich. That's good. Uh, this is a special ministry because it helps people stay alert in church. Uh, so, Pat and your team, may God increase your tribe. Bless you, brother. And uh, by the way, did you guys notice the progress in the cafe this last week? That's pretty exciting. So cabinets in there. I uh, want to give a special thank you to Rex Hilderman. If you know Nolly, that's her dad. They're up there in the balcony. He helped put in that, that pony wall. That's going to be a place where people are going to sit and enjoy their coffee and fellowship. Uh, so, yeah, God's doing so many things. He's using so many people and their gifts, and he wants to use you too. So many ways to serve. And so what we wanted to do is have a ministry fair. We've done these periodically in the past. We felt the need to, to do this again. Mark your calendars, January 21st. I want you to start praying now. What can I do to serve my church family? Out of gratitude to the Lord. And a ministry affair is essentially all of the different ministries of the church, uh, many which already have a team, some which we're looking for people, some that don't have leadership that we need leadership to. We'll have all of these displayed out on the patio. Simply go up, put your name down, contact info. We'll get back to you, share more about it. And we want to kickstart 2024 by getting everybody plugged in. Does that sound good? All right. Let's follow the example of Peter's mother-in-law. Get up and get serving. She served others out of gratitude for Christ who healed her. And she was not the only one healed that day. Look at verse 40. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. So the sun was going down. If you remember the, the chronology of this chapter, it was the Sabbath day. So the sun going down meant that the Sabbath was ending. And this meant that life kind of resumed for these Jewish people. Uh, people could now travel. And so word, word had spread about Jesus and people are traveling out to Capernaum to just receive a touch from Jesus' healing. At this point in his life, uh, Jesus had not yet publicly done a healing on the Sabbath, but he will. And I love those chapters in Luke because it just shows how much Jesus is willing to confront man-made traditions that disagree with the heart of God. And he's going to infuriate the religious leaders. But at this point, he waits until after the Sabbath to do this other healing, uh, other healings for people. The people come in droves. And notice that Jesus touches each and every one of them. And that's our next simple but I think powerful point. Is this. Jesus loves people. <laughs> Jesus loves people. And, and I want that to kind of land different as we consider this story. Because our author Luke is careful to show us how Jesus did this. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy who likes to kind of conquer a lot at once. Anybody like that? If I was going to do something like this. I just say, okay, everybody kind of gather up, 
get in a nice tight circle, boom, you know, and everybody's healed at once, and you can go home and, and put your feet up and rest the rest of the evening, <laughs> but, but Jesus doesn't do that, right? He's very intentional. He didn't just gather them together in one big group and pronounce a general word of healing over them. No, what does he do? He methodically, intentionally, compassionately, and I think patiently engages with each one of these people. In essence, he, he gives them his time. He's given them his time. And, and he lays his hands on each one of the sick, which is a method which showed the source of the healing power, that it was, that it was him. And I also think it shows the personal compassion of Christ. Uh, because some people, you want to give them their, their six feet, you know, social distance. You're like, but no, Jesus touches them. And he doesn't view these people as a number, as an object, but rather as an individual with dignity and value. And he takes the time to love them. And true Christian love always takes time. When you, when you think about your life, someone that you felt genuinely loved by. What's, what's a common theme? What do they have in common? Well, they probably gave you the gift of their time more than anything else. It's significant because time, as we know, is a limited resource. And so Jesus gives these people his time. Uh, remember what he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. He says, Who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Do you feel that? <laughs> Our lives are pretty fast-paced. We feel like we're losing time and we can't get it back. And we're constantly running out of time so we, we can get stingy with it and we don't want to give it away. We don't want to spend it. Isn't that interesting how we talk about time? We're, we're spending it. And sometimes we see people that are MGRs and we think, oh no, they're going to suck up my time. So we want to spend as little time as possible with them. You guys know what an MGR is? MGR, more grace required. <laughs> These are people that usually have a lot of problems, and they like to share them with you at the most inconvenient time for you. And quite frankly, they're difficult to love. But have you ever thought of it this way? Sometimes that's you. <laughs> Sometimes we are hard to love too, and yet Jesus loves us still. And so who is the Lord calling you to love by giving the gift of your time? Because that's what Jesus does, and he's our example. Um, but it's also true that large amount of times with people can be exhausting. And even Jesus felt that way. So I want you to notice what happens next. After taking the time to individually touch and heal everybody, look at verse 41. Oh, and then there's other miracles too. It says, demons also were coming out of many shouting, you are the son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Christ uh, essentially what's going on there is Satan was trying to foil the plan. He was trying to uh, announce the Messiah outside of God's timing. But then look at this, verse 42. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place. So from the plain reading of the text, it seems like Jesus was performing these healings and exorcisms all night long. All night long. And when day breaks, he leaves. He's like, I'm out. That was it. He needs to recharge. So what does he do? He goes back to just him and the Father. And I think this is another lesson from the text today. Even Jesus needed to take a break sometime. And remember that the Sabbath, this is kind of a big deal in the Bible. This command to devote a, a period to rest and worship. After all, that was one of the big ten commandments given to Israel, right? To keep the Sabbath holy. Uh, in fact, there were consequences for not obeying this command. That seemed quite harsh to us. Uh, but, you know, failing to give the land a Sabbath rest was actually the reason that Israel was given over by the Lord into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And so we see that it's important to God. God knows that we all need a regular period of rest. That's, that's what the, the creation week, the pattern he set for us. God didn't need a break from creating on day seven. It's not like, you know, oof, man, making Saturn and Jupiter, that was hard. I need a, need a breather. No, no. God took that break as an example for us. Now, Jesus, who was both God and man in his flesh as a man, 
he did grow weary, and, and what did he do? He took time to recharge and refocus on his relationship with the Father. And believe me, if Jesus, the Son of God, needed it, so do you. And I know in our church there's a lot of really type A people. Type A. Always on to the next thing. No days off. One person said, I'd rather burn out than rust out. Which sounds hardcore. You know, it sounds like a CrossFit kind of thing to say. Uh, burn out or rust out. Either way, you're out, bro. You're out. God doesn't want that. Uh, there's a better way, a good, godly, healthy rhythm of life, which is the Lord's desire for us. Some of us are simply working too hard and too much. Now, there's others who need to go get a job <laughs> and quit being lazy, and that's a different sermon. But for those of you who are working too much, I want you to ask yourself, is my pattern of life causing my spouse, my kids, my relationship with God and other believers to suffer? Do I need to make some changes and adjustments to my schedule in order to thrive just like Jesus did? How can I focus on what matters most, the mission of Christ? And so do I need to spend time with the Father to recharge and refocus? Uh, there's this pastor by the name of Wayne Cordero. He wrote a book called Your Last 5%. Uh, which I came across, and I thought it contained some pretty provocative thoughts in it. See if you're offended by this. <laughs> he claims that 85% of what you do, anybody can do. Are you offended yet? 85% of what you do, anybody can do. Menial tasks, answering calls, writing emails, turning a wrench. Now, anybody can do that. Another 10%, he says, of what you do takes specialized training to pull off. You know, this is why you go to school, why you go to trade school. Uh, but then he points out, if others had that training, they could do that too. <laughs> Don't believe it? Just die and see how quickly they fill your job. <laughs> Which you can't because you're dead, but you guys get the point, right? And so that's 95%, and this is his point. The last 5% is your most important. It's what only you can do. Only you. For example, only you can grow in your personal relationship with Jesus. No one else can do that for you. Only you can be a, a father or a mother to your children. I mean, I don't want anybody else doing that for me. Uh, only you can be a faithful husband to your wife, a faithful wife to your husband. And, and Pastor Cordero, he's, he's making the point, kind of lamenting the fact that we too often ignore that 5% in favor of the other 95%. Rather, we should be nurturing and focusing on that 5% above the others. And I, once I read a book called The Emotionally Healthy Leader by a man named Peter Scott Zero. And he had a simple point in that book. He said, remember, you're a human being, not a human doing. You're a human being, not a human doing. And, you know, there's some things that you're called to do that only you can do. But, you know, when it's all said and done, God's going to hold you accountable, not for how much you did, but what you did that he asked you to do. Which leads us to a final lesson from the text today. Uh, look at verse 42 again. So Jesus leaves, and it says this, and the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And so, you know, these people, they don't, they don't want Jesus to leave. You know, don't, don't leave. They're, they're following him around. You know, we got more people to heal. And this is like, you know, the, the ultimate universal health care plan. And, and they want to make Jesus the mayor of Capernaum. You know, stay here and just keep healing us. And obviously the people are concerned with their physical health. But there's more that Jesus came to do than just heal. Our last point that I want to share today. Jesus knew the difference between concern and responsibility. Jesus knew the difference between concern and responsibility. Jesus did not stay. He left. 
in order to finish the mission he was sent for. Uh, and he wouldn't let anything jeopardize his mission, which was to preach the kingdom of God. Did you notice that? To preach the kingdom of God, which, it, you know, that's a prominent term in Luke, used here for the first time of many. But this is why Jesus was sent to earth. The people were, were focused mainly on his works and not his words. Uh, I don't know about you, but as I read this, I kind of get a, a growing sense of loneliness and the Lord hears the crowds are just begging for miracles and they, they refuse to listen to what Jesus has come to say. And so he moves on. He, he leaves for Judea down south in order to keep preaching that word. And, you know, I might seem a little harsh at first, but aren't you glad he did that? Because <laughs> eventually he went to Jerusalem and died on a cross for our sins and rose from the grave. We're grateful that he kept on traveling because we are the benefactors. Eventually, he goes to Jerusalem, preaching all along the way, and he's going to be nailed to a criminal's cross by his enemies. He's going to die for the sins of the world, for our sins. And Jesus no doubt disappointed some people living in Capernaum, but that didn't matter to him because he knew what his calling and his duty was. And there's oftentimes a difference between people's expectations of you and what God has called you to do. Unfortunately, when we have fear of man issues, we tend to say yes to everything. Yeah, sure, yes, count me in. But did you know that every time that you actually say no, it gives more power to your yes when you do say yes? And here we see Jesus moving on because there was something much more deadly than diseases that he came to cure. He came to deal with sin once and for all. And so he keeps going all the way to the cross where he dies as our substitute. He's buried and then he rises from the dead on the third day in order to conquer sin, conquer death, conquer the devil once and for all. And so as we look at this, this short text today, I hope you see the wisdom of the Lord in so many different ways. First, remember, we can bring our problems to him. He cares about them. He loves people. He loves you. And also notice, he had a healthy rhythm in life. He got away with the Father to recharge. And he knew the difference between concerns and his responsibility. Do we know the difference? And then another thing we learn in today's text is that when you've been a recipient of God's grace, that should motivate you to serve the Lord. So some questions to reflect on in light of what we read about our Lord this morning Am I bringing my problems to Jesus? Where am I serving? Am I serving with a grateful heart as one who has received God's grace in my life? Am I loving people? Am I giving people my time? Do I have a healthy pattern of resting in the Lord? And do I have the wisdom to discern between expectations and responsibilities? Now, now one thing's clear as we close. There is a responsibility that you have today you have a responsibility to respond to what Jesus did for you. Will you accept him or reject him as your Lord and Savior today? That's your responsibility. He came for you. He came to seek and save the lost. If today you're in a place where you've not started a relationship with him, don't delay. The Lord wants you to experience his joy, his peace, and his salvation in your life. He wants to forgive you of each and every sin. And what a beautiful way to start a new year by surrendering to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just mind-boggling, the authority that he has in each and every situation. And as we become students of his life, we can learn many things. Father, I pray that you would help your people apply what they've heard today, that your spirit would take just at least one area of the life of the Lord and inspire them to live it out this week. Lord, is it serving you? Is it loving others? Is it resting in you? Father, we're looking forward to a brand new year. It's going to be a beautiful year here at church as we trust in you, as we wait on you and see what you're going to do. So, Father, we lay it at your feet. We ask that you would send your workers out into the harvest.
because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so, Father, would you stir up your people to serve and love Lakeside like never before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.